Hello everyone. So today we are going to be looking at formal proofs of validity in which we use certain elementary valid forms to derive or to deduce the truth of an argument. So we have already in proposition logic, we have done uh, one kind of proof of validity, which was by using truth tables. Now the thing with truth tables was, as you realized, that the, with the number of component arguments that increase, which means the number of variables that increase, your, the number of the, the complexity of the truth table that you'll have to draw will have to increase. I mean, truth tables are technically sort of capable of um, deriving the truth, but like for us humans who are not computers, it's just too tedious to do it, right? So uh, when there are too many variables, we would it would be nicer to have a um, you know a more efficient method of uh, doing proofs. So in such cases, we use formal proofs of validity, in which there are a few different techniques that we can apply, but we'll first look at what, what are called direct proofs, um, in which you, we use, we depend on certain elementary valid forms of argument. So we have covered things like modus ponens before and modus tollens before. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing that now as well in this lesson and in the next lesson maybe. Um, but um, it, what do these arguments sort of do? So it's, it's like, uh, remember in the beginning when we talked about uh, argument from analogy. So think of these as little arguments, you know, uh, which, are, which are the kind of essence of an argument. So modus ponens, for example, if it rains, there'll be water on the road. It rains, um, there will be water on the road or something, if, if it is raining, sorry. Right, so in, a, in an argument like that, now you can make an analogous argument in which you can replace if it is raining, then there'll be water on the road. And you can replace if it is raining with, uh, let's say, uh, if the moon uh, is shining, then the stars in the sky will be faint. The moon is shining, therefore, uh, the stars in the sky will be faint, you know? So, see, you know, these are analogous arguments. Now, what we do is we sort of like reduce it to the essence and we say, if P, then Q, P, therefore Q, right? And we, we've talked about all this already. So you have a bit of an idea about how we do symbolic logic. Now, um, what, we, what we do in these formal proofs of validity is we take this analogy further in which we replace these sort of essential forms like P implies Q, P therefore Q, with um, more complex forms which look analogous, right? So it could be N and O imply uh, Q or R and S, and so long as the center of it is implication, then you say N and O, therefore Q or R and S, right? So you, we can make that kind of an argument. We can, we can, if you want, you can put it in words as well. So you can have something like, uh, if it is night and the moon is full, then either the stars will not be visible or the stars will be very faint. And what can we do for S? Uh, and it will be very bright, right? Let's say. Uh, so um, then from the uh, second, second, uh, second premise would be, it is night and the moon is full. Therefore, uh, either the stars will be faint or the stars uh, will not be visible. Uh, sorry, I should put it in the other way around. Uh, and uh, it will be very bright. So think of it as a... Uh, you know, that, that whole big complex argument eventually just has its essential form is that of a modus ponens. So what you can do is you can apply modus ponens and then, you know, derive the conclusion without spending too much of your sort of like thinking effort. In fact, what formal proof does for us is it that it helps us to um, not spend too much time in like figuring out complexities. It sort of simplifies um, deduction for us. It simplifies proofs for us, right? So these elementary valid forms are in that sense, basic arguments. They are like very, very basic arguments that can work as uh, what we can call substitution instances or you know, an analogous sort of arguments in other larger arguments, like the example we just had.
right? So uh, now the question is, how many elementary valid forms can we have or should we have? The thing is that uh, it's, we cannot really limit it by numbers because you know what could, seems elementary to some might seem sort of like you have too many forms or the other way around. You know, you think that something is elementary and is not included. So we make the choice by um, what we can call ease and need. So we don't want uh, too many arguments to remember, right? We just want a few arguments that we, we remember so that, you know, there are these few basic forms. And we also need sort of enough that, you know, we can do proofs easily, that we don't sort of, you know, we don't get stuck like, you know, when it can easily be derived in two steps with like one, one more elementary arg argument form. And we are instead, you know, g going in this very sort of circumlocutionary way in which we are sort of then making 20 arguments, you know, uh, to, to sort of like, um, we, we need 20 lines to get to our answer. So we don't, we don't want that. Yeah. So the idea is to just get like the right amount uh, which are necessary to do proofs with ease. Okay? What elementary valid forms do we have? We have already mentioned modus ponens. Now, modus ponens comes from Latin, modus, mode, manner. And ponens comes from ponere, to put or to affirm, in this case, um, in which what you do is you have, OK, let's, let's look at the form. So the first premise of the modus ponens would be a conditional statement, like we just had. If it, if it is raining, then there'll be water on the road. If uh, the full moon is shining, then the stars will be faint. You know, these kinds of arguments, uh, which we usually put as P uh, implies Q. And uh, I'm using the, uh, the arrow for implies because it's the easiest to, you know, to understand what's going on. Uh, it's sort of like intuitive. So P implies Q is the first premise. The second premise is the antecedent of the first premise, right? Which means that if our first premise was, if it is raining, then there is water on the road, then the second premise would be, it is raining. Yeah? That's the form of the modus ponens. Um, so in, in our symbolic form, it will be P, right? The conclusion would be the consequent of the first premise. Right? So this is an elementary valid form in uh, modus ponens, which is a mode of affirming. So if you affirm the antecedent of a conditional premise, then you affirm the consequent of the conditional premise. Right? So that's the form that a modus ponens takes. So if you have an argument like, uh, if the sun is totally eclipsed, then the streets um, are dark, or the streets will be dark. Uh, the sun is totally eclipsed. So we can derive from that that the streets are dark. Yeah. Now, um, what happens if we decide instead to affirm the consequent? Well, if you decide to affirm the consequent, what you will have is a fallacy. Okay. What kind of fallacy? Now, let's look at the same argument that we had. Uh, if I said, um, if the sun is totally eclipsed, then the streets are dark, which was P implies Q, right? Our P implies Q was if the sun is totally eclipsed, the streets are dark. You affirm Q. So you affirm that the streets are dark, yeah? Uh, and from that, you decide to derive P, which is that the sun is totally eclipsed. Does that argument make sense? I mean, think about it. Can that kind of an argument make sense at all? Not really. Why? Because the streets can be dark because it's night. The streets can be dark because there's a storm coming, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the streets being dark uh, are sort of uh, not, uh, uh, what's it called? It's, it's not enough, you know? Um, to claim that the, sun, the, the reason for, uh, you, know, like, uh, you know, the sun, uh, uh, I mean, that, that you can derive that the sun is totally eclipsed from the fact that the streets are dark. Let's put it that way. Yep. 
uh, another example, which was from what, what we discussed earlier as well in our book, was that um, uh, the one of Napoleon, which is uh, a fairly funny example. So if Napoleon was killed in a plane crash, if you remember that argument, then Napoleon is dead, right? Uh, can we derive from the fact that Napoleon is dead that he was killed in a plane crash? You know, not really. Yeah. On the other hand, if Napoleon was ki plane, killed in a plane crash, then Napoleon is dead. And Napoleon was killed in a plane crash, then yes, we can derive that Napoleon is dead. Right. So that's uh, wh what is called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Yeah. So that's uh, modus ponens. So this is this is sort of a revision for you, but like think of it as an elementary valid form that you need to, you know. Remember, right? P implies Q, P therefore Q, and you should be able to apply it even when you see more complicated forms of this argument. Yeah? Then uh, you have its sort of like uh, sister argument, which is modus tollens, which means mode of um, to tolerate actually means to, to sort of remove, to, to sort of lift and get rid of, and, and in this case to deny. Because you know, if opponents uh, was uh, the mode of affirming, then this is the mode of denying. Um, and what form does it take? So the first premise is again a conditional proposition of the form P implies Q. Uh, the second premise, however, instead of being an affirmation of the antecedent in this case, would be a denial of the consequent, right? So um, the second premise would be not Q. Um, so something like, um, if uh, what was it? If, if it is raining, then there'll be water on the road. Uh, it, uh, there is no water on the road, right? So that will be the second premise. And what can you conclude from that? What you can conclude from that is that the antecedent was also probably not true, right? So if you deny the consequent, you deny the antecedent in a conditional premise. That's the idea of a modus tollens. So um, the denial of um, the antecedent of the first premise would be, um, yeah, sorry. So for example, if you look at the example of uh, the sun being eclipsed, totally eclipsed. So if we have, if the sun is totally eclipsed, then the streets are dark. The streets are not dark. Well, then the sun is not totally eclipsed. Yeah. Um, again, is there a mistake that we can make with this? You know, what kind of a mistake can we make with this one? So uh, let's say instead of denying the consequent, we deny the antecedent, right? So if we deny the antecedent, we could say something like, um, if the sun is totally eclipsed and the streets are dark, uh, the sun is not totally eclipsed. Right? Therefore, the streets are not dark. Well, you know, uh, what about nights? As I said, in the, even in the last example, same question, you know, what about at night? You know, are, are you going to say that every night it's because the sun is totally eclipsed? Well, technically, maybe, I don't know. Well, you, you get the idea, right? Uh, or let's look at the other example. Um, if Napoleon was killed in a plane crash, uh, then Napoleon is dead. Uh, Napoleon was not killed in a plane crash. Well, we know that very well. 
if you're talking about the same Napoleon. Uh, therefore, Napoleon is not dead. Well, I mean, there was only one way he could die. You know, he's like, uh, you know, Achilles of a sort. Uh, so you see, you see the issue that we have with, um, you know, like messing around with these elementary valid forms. And that's why I'm telling you about these fallacies that you can commit, like fallacy of denying the antecedent or um, fallacy of affirming the consequent, is that um, you need to make sure that your argument is in that same form. It is analogous to the argument that we were looking at earlier. Um, now, another form that we have already seen uh, and which you should know is the form of the hypothetical syllogism. Yeah? Um, in, an, in a hypothetical syllogism, unlike modus ponens and modus tollens, where the second premise was a simple statement, uh, here all the uh, propositions, so the two premises and the conclusion, it's a syllogism, which is why you have two premises and one conclusion. Uh, so all of them are hypothetical statements, right? Uh, what form does it take? Now, if you remember, so it takes a form, uh, if P, then Q, if Q, then R, therefore, if P, then R, right? So the first premise is a conditional proposition, if P, then Q. The second premise is a con con conditional proposition in which the antecedent is the uh, consequent of P1, right? So the consequent of P1 was Q. The sec uh, second premise's antecedent would be Q, right? Q implies something else, let's say R, right? Or T or S or whatever, right? In this case, R. Uh, so the third premise then would be um, a conditional proposition again whose antecedent is the antecedent of the first premise, i.e. P, and whose consequent would be consequent of the second premise, i.e. R, right? So uh, the third one will take the form of P implies R, and it has the strict form. So again, you need to make sure that you, know, you don't mess around with this, because then you, you will come up with strange arguments that don't make any sense, right? So the correct form of a hypothetical syllogism is P implies Q, Q implies R, therefore P implies R, right? So for example, if population grows, then cities will become overcrowded. Uh, if cities become overcrowded, then pollution grows, 
let's say. Yeah. So, uh, what what are our antecedents and consequence? So, uh, it's the the conclusion will be the antecedent of the first one, which was. Uh, population grows, so if population grows, and our consequent was a consequent of the second premise, so then what happens? Pollution grows, right? So you manage to connect these two arguments by sort of this, um, and, and, and this one you, you would probably recognize from Aristotelian logic, right? This is, this is the middle term, the, if cities become overcrowded, it's a sort of a middle term. It's a, it's, it's, in fact, it's like an AAA proposition, if you remember from Aristotelian logic, right? It's a Barbara. Uh, so uh, what kind of in, invalid forms can it take? Now, you, we, have, we have done enough in you know, um, Aristotelian logic. So if you remember AAA2, AAA3, you know, all these were like invalid forms. So I mean, let's, let's sort of look at one example. So uh, our Napoleon example again. Uh, so uh, whenever they're not linked in the way, so if, the, you know, if, if any of the fallacies are committed, so the middle term is undistributed, et cetera, et cetera. So if we have, um, if Napoleon was a man, then Napoleon was a human being. Uh, if Napoleon was a woman, then Napoleon was a human being, right? Uh, so P implies Q, R implies Q, right? And what you do then is, uh, like, you don't have a middle term. You say if Napoleon was a man, then Napoleon was a woman. P implies R. So that argument sort of doesn't really work. Yeah, there's something, something fishy about it, right? So P implies Q, R implies Q, therefore P implies R. Not really. I mean, if you want to think of it technically, what is happening is a middle term Q, which is uh, Napoleon was a human being, is undistributed. And which means that you know, you're know you looking at two different parts which may not be connected, which in this case, you know, in Napoleon's case, but probably not, we don't know. These ones we've done, we've also done actually one more, which is disjunctive syllogism. So we looked at that as well earlier when we were looking at stoic logic. So what happens in disjunctive syllogisms? So in disjunctive syllogisms, the first premise is a disjunctive proposition. So something of the form of P or Q, right? So uh, either the stars are faint or 
uh, the stars are not visible, right? The, the, our previous argument, disjunctive proposition. The second premise has to be a denial of the first disjunct, right? So it would be not P. So uh, maybe let's skip that star argument. So uh, let's say our uh, disjunctive proposition was, um, I'm either hungry or I am thirsty, right? So I, I, either hungry or thirsty. Uh, I am not hungry, right? So um, what, what can I conclude from that? I can conclude that then I'm thirsty, right? So the idea is that um, you, uh, both of the uh, disjuncts can be true, right? But both cannot be false. You know, that's the idea of a disjunctive syllogism, um, which means that it's a weak disjunct that we are assuming. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about it. But let's look at another example. So let's say somebody uh, messed up like some accounts in an office, right? Uh, and they were brought to uh, the boss and uh, they were told that, and, the, and uh, they were told that like, the, look, this guy has messed up the accounts and it's because he was either incompetent or lazy, right? Now the boss knows very well that this guy was like, super sort of clever, right? So therefore he says, oh, he was not incompetent, right? Therefore, we know that he messed it up because he was lazy, right? Now, um, but he could have been both. Yeah, he could have been both incompetent and lazy when we say he's either incompetent or lazy. So we need to, we need to sort of, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, and what difference does that make? So the difference that it, it does make is that you can have an, invalid disjunctive syllogism of a sort. I don't think we have, uh, I mean, I, I, I can't recall the technical name for that fallacy. But the invalid disjunctive syllogism is when you affirm one of the disjuncts and conclude that the other one is false, right? So if I say he was either incompetent or lazy, and I say he was incompetent, that's what the boss says, and therefore he was not lazy. I mean, can we conclude that he was incompetent and therefore, you know, he must have worked very, very hard and that's why I didn't get anything wrong? Well, not quite, right? Not quite. Uh, why? Because he could be both, as I just said. Yeah. Uh, now, um, what happens when we have actually something like a strong disjunct, right? <coughs> so we have some kind of a statement that says uh, he was either in Delhi or in Bhopal, right? Now, assuming that he could not have been in both places, which, you know, is pretty sort of nat natural to assume, uh, then only one disjunct must be true, which means that if I say he is in Delhi, I should be able to conclude that he is not in Bhopal. Yeah? Uh, well, actually, what happens here is that uh, what we are basically saying here is that uh, not that he is either in Delhi or in Bhopal, but we are saying that it is not the case that he is in both Delhi and Bhopal, right? And if you remember, we have done De Morgan's when we did a logical equivalent statements, and we'll do it again later on. Um, so he was both in Delhi and Bhop uh, he, uh, he, he was not in both Delhi and Bhopal uh, can then be sort of um, resolved or uh, written as he was either not in Delhi or not in Bhopal, right? Uh, so if your first statement is he was either not in Delhi or not in Bhopal, which means not D or not B, right? And your second statement is he was in Delhi, which with double negation, you can say he was not not in Delhi, right? Uh, so therefore, we can conclude that he was not in Bhopal, yeah? So that's the form that the disjunctive syllogism takes, right?
Now, uh, two more forms that we have covered when we did dilemmas, if you remember, which are a kind of combination of modus ponens, modus tollens, and um, you know, disjunctive syllogisms, uh, it are um, sort of fairly useful. I mean, they're not absolutely necessary, right? So you will find texts that don't have dilemmas amongst the list of um, things that they, they would include in elementary valid forms. But these are extremely, extremely useful. So for example, a constructive dilemma will have a conjunct of two hypothetical propositions, right? So, uh, so for example, uh, one could be uh, P implies Q. If it, ra if it is raining, then there'll be water on the road. And the second, I mean, I'm not coming up with a very intelligent argument out here, but you know, that's fine. And the second would be um, if it, uh, um, if uh, the, the moon is full, uh, then the stars will be faint, right? The second premise will be the a disjunct of the antecedent of the two conjuncts of the first premise, right? So if it uh, either it is raining or uh, the moon is full, yeah, it's a weird disjunct, but you know you get the idea, right? And the conclusion that we can derive then excuse me, is, the, is a disjunct of the consequence of the two conjuncts of the first premise. So either uh, there is water on the road or the stars are very faint. As I said, it's not the cleverest argument I've come up with, but you, you get the idea, right? So uh, think of constructive dilemmas as a combination of uh, modus ponens and disjunctive syllogism, right? In which what you're doing is you are sort of uh, doing a modus ponens of like both of them. So you have P implies Q, P, therefore Q, and R implies S, R, therefore S, except your second premise is not, you know, P and R, it is P or R, which means that your conclusion will also be a disjunct, which is Q or S, yeah? Uh, another example, uh, another kind of form that we can take uh, with dilemmas and we can work with is what is called the destructive dilemma, right? Um, the destructive dilemma is uh, very much like a constructive dilemma, except now you will deny, right? So it's a kind of modus tollens. So what you do in a destructive dilemma is that, again, your first premise would be a conjunct of the two hypothetical propositions, which means you will have P implies Q uh, and R implies S. Yeah, your second premise will be a disjunct of the denials of the consequence of the two conjuncts of the first premise, right? Sorry, it was too complicated how I said it, but um, think of it this way. So P implies Q, so first disjunct would be the denial of its consequent, not Q. And R implies S, the second disjunct will be a denial of the consequent of that one, that means not S, right? So you will have not Q or not S, and what can you derive from that? Like with modus tollens, you can derive the denial of the antecedents, so you get not P or not R, yeah? So you will get P implies Q and R implies S, not Q or not S, therefore not P or not R. And um, I can try and remember, I might be a bit rubbish at this, but the argument that we had from like the argument of uh, uh, the Spartan mother and the child who wants to go into politics. Was it Spartan mother, Athenian mother? Anyway, Athenian or Spartan mother, in which she says that if you uh, speak the truth, then the men will hate you. And if you speak lies, then gods will hate you. You will either speak the truth or you will speak lies. And therefore, either the men will hate you or the gods will hate you, right? Uh, and then you have the denial of these, which is, uh, 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 which is how he puts it. So if I speak the truth, then the men will, um, yeah, what was it? Um, no, this doesn't work with a uh, destructive dilemma. But yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good sort of anecdote for a dilemma, for you to remember what a dilemma is. So he sort of, you know, he rebuts it with the horns, like with, a, with another dilemma, which was, um, if, if I speak the truth, then the gods will love me. If I speak lies, then, you know, uh, men will love me. So I will either speak the truth or the lies, or either gods will love me or men will love me. So this is, this is the sort of dilemma form. Um, can we make a destructive dilemma out of it? So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, like, it doesn't make sense, but you could say, you know, the second premise could be uh, either the uh, uh, gods will uh, not love me or, or hate me. He could have re replied to the uh, earlier one, right? Uh, or the men will not hate me, and um, therefore either I will not speak the truth or I will not speak lies. I mean, it's not, it wouldn't be the cleverest argument to make, but you get the idea. Yeah? Now, there are some forms which are so intuitive that you don't even think of making them into sort of argument forms, but they're extremely necessary when you're doing proofs, right? So you get stuck with, let's say, you don't remember dilemmas, or maybe you don't have the option of dilemmas, right? But you have a statement of this sort with two conjunct sort of, um, the two conjuncts together, you know, it's a, it's a compound statement. So you have something like, um, if I speak the truth, then the gods will love me. And if I speak lies, then, you know, humans would love me. So what, what do you do with that? You know, you, you want to do a modus tollens, you know, and uh, your second premise is actually, let's say I speak the truth, right? Now, what you want to do is you want to derive that the gods will love me. How would you do that, you know? So how would you do that is basically you need some kind of an argument to derive that from the first part, yeah? And um, it's fairly simple. In fact, it's called simplification. So what you do in simplification is that if you have P and Q, from that you can derive P. Don't derive Q because for that you would need to commute first and we'll get to commutation later on, right? So you can derive P. So uh, that would like help you, I mean, immensely sometimes, right? So um, that's simplification. Now, what if you have the opposite problem, right? You want to do a constructive dilemma, right? But your premises are in two different places. So the two parts, the, the two conjuncts are in two different places. So one conjunct, uh, if I speak the truth, then gods will love me is somewhere else. And if I speak lies, then humans would love me is somewhere else, right? So uh, these two, Two statements, you want to put them together. So what you do is you do a conjunction. A conjunction is, again, as simple as it sounds, in which you have P, you have Q, and therefore you can go to P and Q. And please remember it's called conjunction, not addition, because addition is something else, right?
addition is, on the other hand, one of the most useful, useful things you can do. Because if you remember, uh, our disjunct, when we talked about a disjunctive proposition, it was a weak disjunct, which means that any one of them had to be true, you know? So only one, one of the two disjuncts needs to be true. So if you have anything, any kind of proposition, which you have affirmed, and in a proof, you know, you all the prop uh, premises that you put in there, you sort of affirm, you know, that's why you have put those premises in there. So uh, to that, you can, with a disjunction, add anything. It could be true or false, or you don't know the truth of it, you know, and the disjunct will be true. Why? Because the disjunct needs only one premise to be true, right? So which means that if you have a P, from that, you can conclude P or Q, right? So if I say, um, it is raining, I affirm that it is raining, right? So uh, to that, I can add, it is raining or um, the mangoes are getting ripe or um, the moon is, uh, you know, a planet. I don't know. <laughs> you, could, you could come up with any kind of mixture of truths or lies, complicated statements, anything, and you can add it, right? It's extremely useful, and you'll find out, you know, it's extremely useful, right? So, um, A, you know, like, okay, like the example that I'm putting forward. So, if you have, uh, this is an apple, let's say, right, that you have affirmed, you can say, this is an apple or this is a ball or this is not a ball, right? So you can also uh, sort of affirm the denial of the other disjunct, which is fine because, you know, like it's all in disjunct, so we don't really care. So you can say this is an apple or this is a ball, this is an apple or this is not a ball. In fact, you can even have a contradictory statement on the other side. side. So you can have this is an apple or uh, this is a ball and this is not a ball, right? But it's separated by a disjunction. So even though that other statement is always false, your disjunct will be true, right? Which means that you can affirm it. Uh, so it is an apple or I am happy today. This is an apple or um, the moon is made of blue cheese. Yeah, so you can come up with absolutely anything you want on the other side of the disjunct, right? Just be careful that one of the disjuncts needs to be affirmed and true beforehand. Uh, and one of the last rules for, the, uh, for this would be what, are, what is called absorption, uh, which is something like, um, it's something very useful for carrying a P across the implicative sign in the consequent, right? So if I say, um, if uh, the moon is full today, uh, then the stars will be faint, right? Therefore, I can say, if the moon is full today, then both the moon is full today and the stars can be faint, right? You think that it's like, I mean, just so tautolog tautologous, why do you even need this argument? Well, it's actually very, very useful because sometimes you want it on the other side, right? Let's say, you know, your, um, the denial that you had was it is not the case that um, um, it, the moon is full and the stars are faint. Right, and uh, they're in a bracket, so you'd have you do D Morgans and you you do all kinds of things, right? Uh, now the thing is that you know, like if you want to find that somewhere, um, you know, with P implies Q, and that's your only other premise that you have, you can actually carry over that P to the other side, and you get P implies P and Q. So this one is called absorption, right?
So um, these are what are called the elementary valid forms. So what you look at, uh, how you treat them is you treat them as uh, analogous arguments, you know, arguments that you can use um, for analogy in some way, uh, for substitution is um, sort of more technical sounding term. And you can substitute wherever you find this form of an argument, you can, you can sort of, you know, use these arguments to uh, derive or to deduce a new line that you can affirm in your argument, right? So they, they are extremely useful. They are, of course, they can only be applied to the whole line of argument, right? So you have to look at, you know, what is, so for example, if you're doing modus ponens, you need to make sure that the first premise is actually actually a, um, an implication, right? If the first premise has implications, but it's a conjunction, so for example, with your constructive dilemma, remember your first premise was a conjunction, it was not an implication. It had two implicative statements, but it is a conjunction, right? Uh, same with, um, you know, the, the destructive dilemma as well. Uh, then you cannot use it, you know, you cannot use modus ponens if your, you know, argue, first premise is a, conjunction, even though it co contains other implicative statements. So you need to look at the whole line, and you need to look at the form of the whole line before you go around substituting it, right? So you need to be careful with these. And um, otherwise, they are extremely powerful tools, extremely useful tools, and very easy to remember, you know? Like, we don't have that many if you think about it, you know? Like, like about 10 of them, so it's super easy to remember, and the more you use it, the more you will get used to using the, using them in your arguments. So uh, yeah, so those are the elementary valid forms. What we look at next are logically equivalent statements, which I shall come back to in you know the next video. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>